Welcome to the D&D Fitness Radio Podcast, brought to you by your hosts, Don Saladino from New York City and Derek Hansen from Vancouver, Canada. Well, I have a conference for you to put out to your 10,000 people, bro. I love it. What do you got? I'm ready whenever you guys are. Tell us about what you've been doing uh, since you have uh, retired. Yeah, so I retired from DEA about a year and three months ago uh, here in San Diego. And um, I, I took about three days of retirement and uh, played golf and then right, went right to work uh, for a company called SureFox North America. And so what SureFox is, it's an executive protection uh, company that started, you know, five years ago with five or six uh, guys. And it's now up to about 850 so the owners are, you know, fantastic folks, um, and, and they uh, had a vision, and you know, li- like a lot of folks, they they stayed to their path, and uh, and so now they have this uh, thriving executive protection business. You know, it's mostly centered in uh, the Silicon Valley area, et cetera. But um, so I started as the director of operations there, and uh, after the the. the the path that we're on now that I'm on now. So my new title is director of school safety for SureFox North America. And the, what kind of happened with that is the leadership, the owners in the leadership at SureFox knew that I had a background in, in school safety because I had been doing it for about 10 or 12 years. I, I, Derek, I think you went to one of the, one of the presentations I did in Vancouver and, and that was with some school safety folks. So I'd been speaking on that circuit for about 10 years and I have some really fantastic contacts in that world uh, that are uh, in one case, and I'll get to her in a second, she's with, without reservation, the world subject matter expert on a thing called digital leakage. And we'll talk about that uh, down the road. And then another, uh, another guy is a friend of mine, Jeff Kay, who owns a company uh, called uh, safety school, school safety operations. And his forte or his expertise is a thing called HVA, which is hazardous vulnerability assessment. And I'll get into that, you know, what those two things are a little bit down the road. So long story short, um, Uvalde happened. And our leadership is all from and based in Texas. So um, they reached out to me and we had a talk about, hey, we, we know that you have a school safety background we would like to take the company in a slight direction towards school safety. And they did it, and we are currently doing it in an altruistic fashion. Um, you know, the, the, the theory is that we, we make enough uh, profit off of uh, the folks that, that we do executive protection for and security for. And the owners wanted to, you know, focus on school safety because they basically felt it was in their backyard and they felt a commitment to school safety and, and both of them have kids, you know, as you guys do. And, and, you know, there's a general feeling out there that we have to do that it's broken. Right. And we have to do something. And every person and every entity that's, that's in the arena that has a good idea that that's a step in the right direction. So they asked me to take this on and start this, uh, this brand new division of SureFox, And so that's where we are right now. Wow. Um, what kind of things are you doing in terms of helping? Like, obviously, we saw what happened with the Uvalde situation, and it looked like everybody was paralyzed. Like, is it is it just that people don't know what to do, um, how to handle these things? Yeah, that, that's that's a good question, and and it's fair, right? And you know, as a former federal agent and police officer you'll find it hard to find a police officer to criticize other police officers, right? Because it's, it's just not what we do. That Monday morning quarterback thing, that just isn't cool in our realm. Um, so I, I wasn't there. I can't speak to it. There'll be an investigation, a thorough investigation. And, and I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that and seeing, you know, what could have been de- done better. Obviously, obviously things that could have been done better. Right. But I think it's only fair to, you know, wait for a real investigation to be done before we start, you know, throwing darts at the wall and saying, well, how come this, how come that? Um, 
you know, inside of the world of school safety, of course, there's, you know, immediately an hour after that happened, my phone was ringing, friends of mine's phones were ringing, and, and we were kind of dissecting it, right? Like, oh, this, you know, ABC, right? But I, I don't feel it's fair to share that right now. But here, here's what I'll say, Derek. In my years of doing this and seeing it, and I've seen the best of the best. I've been to all the conferences. I've seen all the talking heads. I've seen the, the folks that do a theory that read something in a book and get up and talk about it or have a, you know, a Band-Aid approach to, if we just do this, it'll fix it. You know, the, the adage of, you know, let's give, you know, one of the Band-Aids, right, was let's arm teachers and that'll fix the problem. You know, there are so many levels of problems with that fix it set that it, it would take me two hours to explain to the problems that there would be with just arming, if that's the answer, just arming teachers, we would have done that 20 years ago. That, that's obviously not the answer. So let me kind of step you through, you know, what I think the, the best approach to, to kind of doing this, and it's threefold. And if you're not doing all three of these things, then you're not doing it. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's kind of like what you do, right? Like, you know, when you guys are working somebody out, if they're missing one of, if they're not, if they're trying to build arms, right? And they're not doing any tricep exercises, it's going to fail, right? So there's three facets to this, that if they're not all done properly, you're going to, there's going to be a failure in the system. And the first is education. Right. And that's, you know, when you've had me on and we talked about heroin addiction and fentanyl and all the DEA stuff. Right. What did I say? We, we can't arrest our way through this. It's education. And if you see DEA's major push right now, if you get online, it's education, education, education. So um, it, it took us a while to to get around to that as a federal agency. But we're there now. Uh, and, and it's a big, big part of, of what DEA is doing. Obviously, we're still doing what we do you know, arresting uh, traffickers and, and money laundering and all that. But the education piece is, is really, it's, an, it's so important. So by education, I mean on several levels on this, right? So it's about educating parents, right? Because they're always left out. You know, the education is always done at the school level, right? Or at the school resource officer. So when we say SRO, that's school resource officer. That's a police officer that's dedicated to a school or a set of schools. That's all they do. They don't respond to calls. They're, they're called SROs. So what we focused on in the past, and which was wrong, was only educating SROs. Then we realized we need to educate SROs and teachers. And then we realized that we need to get above SROs and teachers because they agree with what we're saying, but they don't have the ability to pull the trigger, which gets a really bad analogy. They don't really have the ability to, to make it happen, to put funding towards something that would be advantageous. So then we realized a years into that, that we needed school administrators, we needed school, uh, uh, school board members. So anyone that was involved in the school process was it's important that we touch all of those facets, right? So we're doing that now. So the conference that we're having in April, April 19 and 20 in Las Vegas, the Sure Fox School Safety Conference is targeted towards school administrators, principals, um, school board directors, school board members, but anyone can come, but that's who we're trying to get to because those folks actually have the ability to make it happen. The teachers, the principals, the SROs, they all agree with what we're talking about, with what should be done. And I'll get to that in a second. But they don't have the ability to make it happen, right? They don't have the ability to, to execute funding towards that mission. So that's one, right? We said there's three. The second part of it is called HVA. It's Hazardous Vulnerability Assessment. So we call it hazardous and vulnerability because when you're assessing, assessing a school, Right. Say we were to go to your school in Vancouver, your, your, your son's school, and we would send two or three folks and we would do an assessment, an overall assessment of the school. We would look at what's the front entrance look like? How many doors are open during the day? Is there window film 
uh, on the windows next to the doors, which was which was unfortunately happening in Newtown. That, that's what happened. He broke through the window uh, and, and walked through the window instead of going through the door. So um, we'll, we'll do that hazardous vulnerability assessment. And the reason that we, we use the word hazardous, because unlike a corporation, right, a school, we have to look at what happens if there is a flood? What happens if there is a tornado? What happens, if, especially in California? What happens if there's an earthquake? So we also give the school a report on that, on you know where they stand, you know are they close to a fault line, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very in-depth report and it's, it's provided to the school and the school board. And we give them a list, say it's 10 things that need help, right? We know they don't have the money to do 10 things at once. No, most schools don't have that kind of funding. They have to ask for it. So they're told in 2023, these are your weaknesses. It takes them to 2024 to get the funding, right? Because they need to show in a grant or to the school board or to the state or to the federal government, to FEMA, that, hey, we have these, uh, we have these issues that need to be addressed. So what we try to do is we break it down into like the three things that need immediate attention. Right. Let's say it would be that there's three doors open to the school. So the first thing is very, very easy, right? It's single point of entry. Only one door you can get through, get to and get from going in and out of the school. So that's an easy fix, right? And it doesn't cost anything. All it costs is all it's basically um, fortitude, right? It's the principal demanding that no other doors are opened at any time, right? And and then following up on that. So that's the HVA side of it. And so then the third piece, and like I said, if you're not doing all three, there's, there's a weakness in the armor. The third piece is digital leakage. And that's where my friend, uh, Teresa Campbell comes in, uh, a Vancouver native like yourself. So Teresa is, and, and I say this unabashedly, she is the world's foremost authority on digital leakage. And what digital leakage is, if you look at all of these uh, school attacks, murders really is what they are. If you look at them in the 90 percentile, I've asked Teresa, hey, when you look at these post, post fact, what percentage of them was their digital leakage? And I'll explain what that is in a second. And she told me it's over 95%. So what that is, is the perpetrator, the bad guy or the, the bad girl, weeks, months, or years up to the event, up to the attack, they have put out on social media their thoughts, their ideas. And what they do is they build towards that, right? They're angry, they're more angry, they, they become victimized, they decide that they're gonna target ABC school, and then they start to talk about targeting ABC school. So that is done in the vast, vast majority of, of these attacks. So what Teresa does is she works with uh, school, school uh, districts, and they pass on to her what's called worrisome online behavior. So that's when your student, your son will come home and say, hey, there's this kid at school and he's talking about like shooting up the school and you know he sends out these crazy text messages of him with a gun, right? So that information is passed to Teresa and, and her folks at SST, which is Safer Schools Together. And they do a, a deep dive into that person's uh, social media. None of it is on the classified side. It's all open source. It's all stuff that the student or the adult, in some cases it's adults, has put out there for the world to see. And then they dig into it and start to look at the seriousness of it. Of course it's serious, right? But on a scale of one to 10, it's Teresa's job and her folks to get back to the school board as soon as possible, in most cases within an hour of getting the information and letting them know, hey, this is probably a seven out of 10, or this is maybe a two out of 10. How but often is that the garners, time. go ahead. Sorry, sorry to jump in, but I, I had this thought in my head. Yep. I have to imagine this is happening pretty frequently, right? I mean, we're in a small district and I heard a story in the last two years of a kid, young kid, you know, saying something that, shouldn't have been said, right? Like how often is this, this is, this is pretty common for 
children. These are these are children. When you're when you're in a our like our high school in our district, it's grades seven through twelve. Right. So you're gonna have someone say something that just was off color, call it what you want, um, offensive, wrong. How often is this happening at schools? Is this common where every school is going through this? Don, every yeah. school goes through this, right? But there's two types of schools. There's the open school and a closed school. And the closed schools don't want to let anything from the outside penetrate. In other words, nothing bad happens here, right? And, and that's the old school. Think of it like the ultra expensive private school that they don't want the parents to think anything wrong is going on. I, I can give you so examples they're, they're basically, So, So in a, in a way, they're, the, the schools are closing this information off to the parents. Yes. They're, everything's under the table, which is, it's wrong, isn't it? Like, should, Absolutely. A, yeah. That's, the, that's like the 1985 mentality, right? It's all about transparency, right? Especially... If you're paying for your child to go to a school and or it's a public school, the school, you deserve to know the truth, right? So you see these lockdowns, right? I'm sure you get messages that say your school went into lockdown, your school went into lockout, right? There's all these different phrases that are used. So it's a really long conversation, but I'm going to try to compartmentalize it the best I can. So the short answer to what you're saying is it's constant. Right. But Don, when you and I were in high school, right, there was the kid that said stuff, right? I I can picture the kid that I'm thinking of from my high school right now that would say, you know, crazy stuff. And you knew he was just a crazy kid that he probably wasn't going to do it. Because of where we are now, that's unacceptable. You can't, that kid can't just go on saying stuff like that now. That has to be addressed. But the majority, the vast, vast majority of this stuff done is over the internet. It's not some kid walking down the hallway saying something. It's some kid on TikTok. It's a kid on, you know, putting pictures on Instagram, especially TikTok, because they know it's only going to be there, you know, for 45 seconds or however long they want it to be, or excuse me, Snapchat. So our people or Teresa's people have the ability to dig into that stuff. They are experts at looking at this, what we call digital leakage, right? Leakage because it leaked out of who it was supposed to, it was supposed to go from Don to John, but it leaks out and, and we pick up on that. We, it leaks because we're looking for it. What are right. the platforms doing? Are they screening any of this stuff and feeding it to people like yourself or is it anything happening there? So Teresa's had several conversations with the platforms, right? And, and you know, from, you know, the Elon Musk, the recent Elon, Elon Musk, you know, the, releasing of the Twitter information and all that. Their goal, right, is not to be intrusive of their client, right? They don't want the client to think that, like when I worked for DEA, right, they were very standoffish with us about giving us information because they don't want the client to think that they're working with the government to surveil their comments or their, uh, you know, their First Amendment rights, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, they work with her and they work with law enforcement when you can show that there's an immediacy to it. Not just, hey, this kid put up a picture of a gun, right? But if you can show an immediacy, they're, they're obviously willing to help. But not all of them are US based. You know, TikTok is Chinese based, but they'll, you know, they do have an entity in the US that's responsive to law enforcement and, and for critical incidents. But all of them have a different opinion on how they're going to handle this. I would say in 2023, it's much better than it was in 2021. They've seen that they need to be of assistance, you know, to stop something, a horrible uh, occurrence from happening. So I think it's getting better and it will get better. But again, that's education too, right? That's us talking to the school board, the teachers, the parents, the PTA to demand this. It, it can't be just us in the forest yelling, hey, you should be more open. It, it has to come from, from the grassroots that you need to be more open to help the safety of our children. I'm, I'm actually shocked 
you know, I, I've had some experiences over the past year where getting in contact with some of these entities that you're talking about, you know, you know, you mentioned TikTok, Instagram, but even, you know, um, specific online companies that are almost primarily digital, right? There's no one yeah. on the back end. And there were like major problems, like banking issues where they were falsely holding, you know, finances for a completely, you know, nonsense. Like it was, it was ridiculous, the things going on, or like you just, you triggered something because you said DEA had a difficult time dealing with them. Like, this is DEA. This is our government. Like, what are you talking about? Like, how is this possible? Like, how is it? How has it become that these entities like Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, they're almost becoming a bit stripe. They're becoming a bit untouchable, right? Like they're, you want to get in touch with them. It's not as easy as picking up a phone call. If someone is on a social media platform posting about hate crimes, posting about weapons, you know, posting about killings, bombings, why are we still, why are we seeing this shit all the time? Why is this still something? I have children 15 and 14 and I'm shocked on the stuff that falls on my lap. The fact that, you know, it doesn't even sound like there's a hand slap going on here and that we're continuing to see people push the envelope. They want to push the envelope because they're into their vanity metrics. They're into seeing if they're getting a thumbs up from someone that's validating their happiness. But the fact that, you know, the government can't get involved anymore or these entities are becoming untouchable, it's mind blowing to me. I don't I don't understand how that's even the case. You guys, are the, you were the government. You guys are the government. It's like, how is it that's difficult for you to handle? So, you know, when this all started, right, what was it, 15 years ago? I, I, I can't roughly, put it. Roughly, on. roughly. About 15 years ago, right? We kind of saw that this, D, we being, you know, DEA, federal government, federal law enforcement, FBI, friends of mine, the FBI, Secret Service has, has, has the same problems as we have. We saw it as be, being a problem, but they, they hired or had what's called law enforcement liaison. And a law enforcement liaison is a person who probably or should have had law enforcement background, like a retired FBI agent or a retired Secret Service or a retired NYPD. And they would go to work for one of these companies and they would try to fix the issues, right? And we would go to them and say, hey, this guy is talking about, you know, drug sales on, is advertising prices on his website or on his blog or whatever, right? And they would try to work with us. And then it exploded, Don, right? It went from two platforms to six platforms. You know, at, at one time, you know, there were, how many were there? 15, 20 out there. And most of them went out of business, right? Because, or they got bought up by another company. So we still have that law enforcement liaison ability, but they will fall back on, rightly or wrongly, they will always fall back on the First Amendment thing and the FCC. And, you know, if you, if you watch Congress trying to get a handle on this, I, you probably saw that, right? Where they they had executives up in front of Congress, and you know we had eighty year old men asking questions about you know platforms, and they looked ridiculous because they were asking just silly questions. So that didn't help at all because it made it look like the the Congress and the Senate was trying to take this thing seriously, and the questions were just ridiculous and. I, I think that the entities kind of walked away from it saying, okay, we did everything we could. We went to Congress, we testified. What else do you want us to do? So it's a huge question out there, right? And, and, and you're right, you know, when you say that you get enraged because some kid is allowed to pontificate about, you know, being a, a, a racist or a white nationalist and there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's probably the question for law enforcement and for society, probably for the next five or 10 years, right? But it, it doesn't it kind of go back, you know, just having a discussion with you guys, doesn't it go back to about 15 minutes ago when I said grassroots, when I said it's not just getting the teachers and the principals in line or, you know, in step to, to better security, it's about, the it's about the parents. It's about, you know, rising up 
and saying enough, you know, we've had enough. You know, if you look at Colombia, you know, around the Pablo Escobar time, a million people went into the plaza in Bogota with the signs that said no mas. And it got the attention of the Colombian government. They were like, whoa, there's a million people down there that have had enough of this. So, and the, the sad part, Don, is, you know, like you, you hear all the presidents, you know, Biden, Trump, um, Obama, you hear them do a press conference after a mass killing in a school. And then there's this outrage, right? For about six or seven days, and then it subsides, right? It's back to, oh, well, another shooting, another killing. Isn't well, that's that my next, well, that's my next question. We've, we've been seeing, I'm trying to think of the first mass one I remember seeing. I mean, how many years ago was that? Um, Probably um, Jones, I think it's Jonestown, Kentucky, or uh, pa Paducah, Kentucky. I think that was oh, one of the a, first there's ones. There's another one. But there's they go back hundreds of years, by the way. There's ones back in the, in the Cowboys days where a, 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 a guy went into a school and killed like 12 kids. In a yeah, but let, let, let's, let's talk in the last 10 years, right? Not to yeah. mention, not to go down that rabbit hole, but how has it really evolved? I, I go into my kid's school and, you know, you walk through a security check-in and they announce you, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you walk through the door. Is that, is that enough? Is yeah. that enough? So no, it's, it's, I don't want, it's always, you know, you always hear someone's in the school with a gun. How the hell do they get in there? Why do they allow this? Why is it, why isn't there an armed guard to the front? It costs money. Right. But right. is it really, all right. At, at what expense, you know, for, for, you know, these families who lost children, they would have paid any amount of money to have an armed guard. Sure. Tax me an additional, you know, $500 a year, you know, in the district I'm in to make sure that you, you know, like that, that's peanuts. Right. I don't care how much money you end up making. Life is life. Money is money. Money's bullshit. Right. It's, it's why can't we get extreme with all this and make sure that this never happens again? Like they've been pretty extreme about the airlines. Right. Right. Yeah. It's like, all right. Like I haven't heard the last time someone's gotten on a plane with a knock on foot. I don't even want to say it, but you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, like, yeah. Pretty hardcore getting into the airports. Why is it suddenly you're so hardcore getting into an airport, but going into a, a school with a defense, a defenseless child, you know, they're not taking those same precautionary measures. So Don, there's probably 10 layers to that, right? Some of it is politics. A lot of it is money. A lot of it is depending on the school district and where it sits in the United States. Um, you know, um, do they, some schools don't want that look, right? They don't want to make the school look like it's a, a prison that you're getting in and out of. Some schools are perfectly fine with doing that in a nuanced way where it doesn't look like that. But you, you hit the magic, you know, the magic button there is money, right? But the, the most important thing that you kind of hit on, I'll get back to the money part, but the most important thing you kind of hit on, and we're going to be talking a lot about at this conference in April, is liability. So the, in, in 2023, if you are a school board or a principal, it is impossible for you to say, I didn't know. There's a presidential directive out there that talks about emergency operation plans, and talks about what the minimums that schools are held to um, for the defense of the child while the child is in the care of the school, right? So it gets really complex because let's say you're in a district that has 20 schools and an HVA, kind of what we talked about, right? A hazardous vulnerability assessment has been done at 16 of those schools, but the other four schools don't have the money to pay for that or don't have the ability or choose not to. Let's say they choose not to. And one of those schools that, that the HVA wasn't done at is attacked. You have a very, very serious liability issue. As you see in Uvalde, the numbers that will come out of Uvalde liability wise are gonna be enormous. It will be and one of the things we try to talk about, you know, at the conference and all the time when we're meeting with school administrators is it, it's kind of like, you know, not to be crass. There was an old commercial. I forget what it was. It was like some car parts, pay me now or pay me later. 
you can pay now, right, for the training and for the vulnerability assessment and for someone to take a good look at your school, or you can be sued later when it happens. And the, the lawsuits, kind of what you're getting to, paying for this upfront for, on the grant side, on the federal grant money, on the state grant money, is so is such a, a better deal than just, if you're just looking at money, I'm not talking about the loss of life. You know, I don't mean to be uh, black and white about this at all. But if you're just looking at from the comptroller side, are you gonna pay, you know, $4,000 upfront to, to have an assessment done and have a, an emergency operation plan done? Or are you gonna pay 40 million later? Because you are going to pay. Like Uvalde, those numbers, those lawsuit numbers for negligence are going to be outrageous. You're never going to hear them because they're all going to settle out of court. So part of settling out of court is that the, the amounts are never announced, right? But those numbers, the numbers at Parkland, the numbers at Newtown, they're enormous numbers. And so unfortunately, it's a matter of money. It's a matter of motivation. The school district, the principal, they have to be motivated to get it done. We are seeing, you know, in, in the school safety realm, we are seeing a big push for it. it. It is out there. And unfortunately, the thing that motivates it is an attack at another school. But unfortunately, again, Don, the prevailing concept is, and I've heard it with my own ears. I was at a conference with Teresa and we were sitting at, at her booth outside of the, the conference hall and a person, I'm not gonna say where they're from, walked up to the booth and we were talking about digital leakage, they were asking about it. And the person who was a shot caller in a school district said, yeah, I don't really need that. We live in a really nice neighborhood. That'll never happen in our school, quote unquote. So I thought that that was out there, but I thought, nah, that can't be real. It is, the person said it to my face. So I know it's real. So if one person said it, how many people were thinking it? And, you know, much like we talked about, right, Derek, when we talked about fentanyl and, you know, what was that two years ago? Look where we are now, right? It's, you know, remember you asked me, is it going to get better or worse? And I said, you're not going to want to hear this, but it's going to get way worse. We're at that point, right? It's way worse. You know, much like that, your zip code does not excuse you from this stuff. It doesn't excuse you from opioid overdoses. It certainly does not excuse you from school attacks. If you look at their most recent ones, they're very affluent neighborhoods. And it, that's not, there's no armor in how much money you have, kind of like you alluded to, Don. So our suggestion is at least start down the path, right? At least if you're not doing any of those three things I spoke of, right? If you're not doing education, if you're not doing hazardous vulnerability assessments, if you're not doing a digital leakage assessment, at least start with one and then have a plan for the second one. And then in your two-year plan, have a plan for the third one. But just doing nothing and hoping that the big bad wolf doesn't knock on your door, that's not going to work. It's not if, it's when, you know, because you know, exactly. it's, it, it, it's sickening. It's going to happen again. Like these, these tragedies are going to happen again until there's some type of systematic approach. I'm just shocked. I keep going back to the airlines. We're seeing things, or at least I feel like it's getting better in that aspect. Yeah, um, do we need to overreact as opposed to underreact? Because there was that six-year-old who shot a teacher in Virginia and there, she's suing the school district and the, the school. Um, and, uh, you know, there were people who sort of checked his bag and didn't check this. And there was word on the street that this kid was carrying a gun, seen carrying a gun, and nobody did anything. Does it have to be to the point where we overreact now? Like when somebody jokes about a bomb waiting in security at the airport where they grab them and they throw them down, do we have to do that now? So, in, you know, in most schools, you know, uttering utterance of like a bomb or I have a gun, they, they will take action. They're not going to just. Well, oh, what does that just, mean? What does that mean? Not to, sorry, John, but like, like if someone mentions I'm going to kill you or, or, or I'm coming in with a bomb or they mention these trigger words that are serious. Shouldn't there be a probation period where like now I'm not saying you're on house arrest, but you've heard stories of people on probation being monitored constantly. Shouldn't it be where your life is being monitored now? And you're so even a young kid, like, all right, 
Does that sound extreme? I don't think so. I think then their social media should be monitored. I think they should be having check-ins with a probation officer of some sort or, or something of that nature. That should trigger some red flags to where the government, I believe the government, should be taking some precautionary measures again. And 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 that's an opinion, right? On the flip side of that, Don, I can find 50 people that would tell you that that's egregious and that you are um, you are stepping on the rights of that child and the child should be able to um, manifest their opinions. And I know you don't want to hear that, but I'm telling you there's a flip side to that. And it, it's not much difference in this concept, what you guys are talking about, right? In school safety and, and utterance and threats, Unfortunately, it's not much different than the chasm between red and blue states, right? It's people are dug in on what they're going to think, and they don't want to hear the other side's opinion. So there are facets in, um, in schools in the U.S. and in Canada that are dug in on, um, on children's rights, on the ability for free speech, and there are people that are dug in on your side of it. And it's, a, it's very hard to, to put those two ropes together, right? Because they're so dug in on their um, moralistic political views that the children, the other children in the school suffer because of these idealistic views, either on the right side or on the left side. How could that, someone that characterize- permeates, That permeates how, schools. How Every could school someone, district is different, right? How could someone categorize you know, a 16 year old saying, I'm going to come into the school and shoot everyone is free speech. Like that's not, that should not be categorized. I mean, who the hell is ever going to say, I'm sorry if I'm overstepping right now, I apologize, but no, you're not. there are specific lines yeah. that as human beings, we need to make sure we're not crossing. And if we do, I'm sorry. It, it, it's, it's, there's certain things that should be said and that shouldn't be said. I, I agree with you, but getting, you know, and, and Derek said, should we overreact, right? When you overreact, it pushes the buttons on the other side of C, we told you that's what would happen because folks on the, uh, on the flip side of that are basically saying that the government, the school district is, is constantly trying to take away our rights. They can't tell me how to, um, how to you know, take care of my child how to punish my child. That's not, and making them stay home. I'm just telling you, there's a flip side to that. I, I wish that we could um, mediate that better than, than we have. And I think that is the future, right? The future has to be, if you say, it's basically say something, do something, right? That's kind of what you're getting to. If you're going to say it, we're going to do something about it. And, and there are school districts that do that for sure. For sure. I can't name you which ones there are, but there certainly are school districts that are very uh, uh, in line with kind of what you're saying. But there are hundreds, if not thousands, that would never think of doing that. And again, Don, unfortunately, it's not the kid walking around the school saying something. It's the, it's the child in the school on their TikTok, on their Snapchat. That's where these conversations happen. And then one kid picks it up and then it turns into a snowball effect, right? And then fortunately what happens is one kid has enough sense to go to their parents and say, hey, look at this, look what Bobby put out. And then the parent reacts like you would react, right? And, and that's, a, that's a, a step in the right direction. Then people like Teresa and, and law enforcement can get involved and, and try to cut these off. Because what I, there's one thing I want to say, though, it's not all doom and gloom because, you know, the attacks and the murders obviously get the, the front page news in the media, but you never hear about the thousands and thousands of lives that were saved by intervention, by a school doing the right thing, kind of what you're talking about, right? By Teresa digging out some digital leakage information that is given to the police and the police go to the kid's house, talk to the parents, take the guns away, et cetera. We're never gonna know how many 
thousands of lives were saved, but there are wins out there. I don't want you guys to take away that this is all doom and gloom. Of course. We're no. getting better at this. We, we are. Should, should they and publicize that? Better. Should they publicize that though to show that you guys are actively making a difference? Like, and so there is some hope. And that's a great like, question, Derek. But doesn't it go back to it doesn't happen at our school? Yeah. Well, even some of the stuff you told me about potential terrorist threats that are intercepted and we never hear about that either. And it'd be nice to kind of almost hear about that. Yeah, you know? I was I was flipping around on TV the other day. It was Netflix, I think. And I, I came across a show and it said, um, it was something like the terrorist acts that almost happened. And that was intriguing. I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, so that kind of goes, I didn't watch it, but that kind of goes back to, you know, kind of what you're saying. You know, that's a conversation, Derek, for sure. That's a conversation that we need to have. Um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll give you some transparency from DEA, right? At the end of the year, you know, DEA, we have an internal affairs division. It's called OPR, Office of Professional Responsibility. And at the end of the year, um, they put out a report that talks about investigations that they did throughout the year. It doesn't name names, right? It just says, it's like a, like a, a overview of the investigation and what came of it. And it's, it's a way to show mistakes that are being made and folks that were in leadership like myself to realize, oh, it's kind of like if there were 10 investigations, seven of them were the same thing, right? So it enables us to kind of focus attention and training on that one particular subject, which looks, because there's nothing better than reality, right? If these 10 investigations happen and seven of them were misconduct in an official car, right? That tells us what? That we need to focus on training and, 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 and management of using the official car properly, right? So there's a really good point that you bring up about that. And I've had that conversation with Teresa and what Teresa and Jeff both do and will be done at the conference in April is we talk about wins. We don't mention the name of the school unless the school says it's okay, right? And we talk about, we do case studies on tragedies, right? Uh, like we have a case study that's gonna be done on the Parkland tragedy. But Teresa and Jeff are gonna do case studies on things that worked. Like, Jeff has been involved when he was in Palm Springs as a director of, uh, of school safety. He was involved in, in several um, suicide attempts that were prevented because it was online. The girl was professing she was going to kill herself. One of the kids sent, you know, called a 1-800 anonymous number, said you need to check on, you know, Susie. Uh, they go to Susie's house and lo and behold, you know, they were able to save Susie from trying to kill herself. So there are wins out there. I don't want you or the listeners to think it's doom and gloom. It's not good, but there are wins out there. And I will say this, Teresa and I had a long conversation um, during COVID and, um, and I spoke to another mental health professional who's a very close friend of mine, um, who's a professor at Georgetown and MIT on, on mental health. And he told me and Teresa agreed that we are in hell for the next two or three years coming out of COVID because of this um, children at a certain, at certain, you know, meaningful ages of their brain, not being able to uh, be with like children, like age people, it will have a very, very bad effect. And that effect could take three to five years to mend itself. My friend told me he thinks it'll take 10 years because that extracting a child away from being in, in a group setting or being in the team where they're at home has a, has a lasting effect. And Teresa told me that, you know, she, she can chart um, incidents. We call them incidents, right? Some, some are thwarted, some happen, right? Some are, she's able to stop, but, but some are a response. Some is a forensic report, like Uvalde, you know, the folks from Uvalde called Teresa to do a forensic check on, on, uh, on that young man's um, social digital uh, platform. And it was there. It, it, we, she could see it. They, she could see the ramp up. But long story short, she told me that after, you know, COVID, kids started going back to school post-COVID, the numbers were off the charts. Off the charts. 
And I talked to a principal of a school here in California and she was telling me like the first four or five months back and she was doing second graders, I think, that the amount of violence between the children was something like she's never seen before. That there was absolute violence between seven-year-olds because they were at home. They didn't, they, they didn't have first grade and second grade where they were told, you know, you can't take that from Susie. Hey, stop pulling Susie's hair, right? That, that they were at home with their siblings. And her, her point to me was she thought it was worse because of, of sibling fighting, right? Which you may have seen, Derek, in your life, you know, where the seven-year-old smacks the five-year-old and, you know, you yell at them, but it's happening behind your back. And these kids went back to school with this mentality. And it was really interesting to hear it from uh, my, my friend from MIT, from Teresa, and then someone with boots on the ground, a principal who I didn't talk to about this. When I started talking about, you know, school safety, she told me we're at a dinner party and she's like, John, I can't tell you, I've never seen violence, child on child violence, like I've seen in the last six months. She said it kind of curbed after the teachers and the principals were away, you know, told the teachers, hey, you got to stop. But my point to that is when you grow that out five or six years, where are we? I, I, these, these young six, seven, eight year olds, they really need attention now because we're just hoping that that did not, um, that, that negative uh, negativity did not get planted in their, in their brain of, of not being able to socialize. Have you seen any of that, you guys, or have heard? Well, have you heard it in school? I've seen videos of people freaking out at Starbucks and Walmart, yeah. and yeah. It, it's everybody. It's it's right. definitely it's it, it, maybe it's videoed more, but it definitely seems to be a trend. Don't you know what's yeah. ironic? You, you know what's ironic? It's you know when we were growing up, remember you had rated G, rated PG, rated PG thirteen, rated R, rated X, like you right. had different ratings, and your parents were concerned at a young age or. They were concerned in the movie theaters. You walk into a rated R movie and you're 12 years old, you better be with a parent. I remember being stopped as a young kid when I was allowed to go to the movies by myself. Yep. It's bizarre to me how something like that was taken so seriously at a certain time, yet now, listen, I, I, I'm on social media all the time for work, but my, I think my kids have a pretty good head on their shoulders with it, but there was a time when they were younger where they were like, well, so-and-so saying this. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? Well, it's true. They're saying it on social media. And I'm like, you know, you're talking to an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, and it's unavoidable. It, it, it is now when I, I, I used to believe that my kids aren't going to have a phone till they're 15, 16 years old. Yeah. All right. Like then suddenly like assignments are being sent on a yeah. specific app and Teachers are communicating sports schedules on an app and everything's on this app. Now you suddenly have to communicate with your children. I didn't have a phone growing up. My mom would say, be here at this time. I was there. We'd go to a pay phone. Now you have to have a phone, right? Everyone's justifying it and kids are getting them younger and younger, but it doesn't seem like that there's any, you know, they'll, they'll turn around and they'll, and they'll block a post that I put up because I use specific music. That's not, you know, that, you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> That's not legal. So now like my YouTube video is playing Guns N' Roses in the background and they take it down. Yeah. Right? Banning you from that. Right. But then you, you see someone posting about some woman falling down a, a 40 foot stripper pole, crushing her skull in and everyone's passing around laughing at it. It's like, brother, the, what's going on here? Brother, I, I can't agree with you more. And there's no putting a genie back in the bottle now. Right. And, so, you know, I talk about this uh, when, I, when I talk about school safety. You know, I'm older than you guys. So I was born in 64. So I remember when I was like 10, 11, 12, maybe a 10, right? Like, you know, you're coming of age as a boy. And I remember when like the JC Penny catalog or the Sears catalog would show up at our house and I would sneak to the back pages and look at the bras, right? 
And that was like porn as a 10 year old, right? And, then, you know, and all your friends were like, oh, the new catalog's out. <laughs> Bro, think about it now. On this thing right here, you can see the most egregious, disgusting porn that, you know, you or I would turn away from. A seven year old can easily get into that. There's nothing, all it says is, are you 18? You just click yes, right? I just, you know, I've had talks with mental health professionals, like I told you, we are gonna pay the price for this down the road. This is not normal. It's not human, it's not a normal human condition for those visions and thoughts to enter your brain at that age. Nor is it, and listen, you know, there's, there's, there's an argument on the other side, I'm sure, but look at, the, look at a game, right? Like Grand Theft Auto. And I know it makes more money than Avatar, right? When it comes out, you know, you know, God bless them. But a couple versions ago, it was explained to me that part of the game was you get extra points. You know, you're the bad guy. You portray yourself as the bad guy. You would get extra points for getting a hooker and not paying her and or if you killed her after the transaction. Yeah. Now, explain that to me. How does, you know, like you said, Don, I couldn't go into a, a you know, I wasn't, I, I, will, I will confess this. My sister snuck me into The Exorcist and that was like 1973. I was like nine years old. I paid the price for about 20 years of my life. So <laughs> there's a reason that, you know, there were R-rated movies because it affected me, trust me, for about 20 years of my life. Yeah, yeah. But, Tell me that that doesn't sink in your brain, right? And, and I know there are, you know, and then when, remember when like um, Tipper Gore, do you remember like she wanted to put labels on rap songs, right? And, and, and there's, you know, I don't agree, with, you know, with stifling communication, but you could see kind of her thought process, right? Was why is it okay to diminish women and for, other for folks to use the n-word incessantly for kids to hear but like you said it, and at that same time we were not allowing a 14 year old to go into an r-rated movie so it was almost like one section of society said, you can't see this but you can hear and see that and it's all off the table now don yeah <laughs> it's it, it's inconsistent um listen like you said it's not all doom and gloom i think there's uh, some amazing things that social media has done for society. You know, everyone wants to always point that it's all negative, this and that. No, you know what? I mean, honestly, throughout the pandemic, if my kids didn't have the ability to Zoom call with their friends or with their yep. teachers, man, could you imagine now your children are home with no form of communication? It, it, it's, you know, right. I, I would have become real. So I'm, I am grateful for, for that. I just feel like, you know what? You know, we... <laughs> So it should be governed to an extent. And, and it's yeah. the whole freedom of speech. Yes, freedom of speech. I am American. I believe in freedom of speech. But there's a difference between freedom of speech and going in and saying specific things that can harm others. You know? It, it, it comes down to yelling fire in a theater, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't do that. All right, freedom of speech. I can say what I want. Really? Can you really? Was right. that like, you can, someone could have tripped and broke their neck. Right. You could have killed someone. Oh, I was joking. You could have killed someone. Yeah. They could have went in order. You know what people, when people panic, and I don't mean like I'm seeing a spider. I mean panic. Yeah. In situations that you've seen and maybe Derek and I haven't seen. Oh, I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, people are people. Uh, I'm saying you've seen it. Dude, I've seen, are, I've seen cops panic. Yeah. I, I, mean, they, they, panic. I mean, yeah. scared shit can happen. So, yeah. um, John, listen, thank you. Thank you for this. It's always <laughs> A pleasure having you on. Tell, really. tell us a bit about the conference before you before you yes. say it. Yes. So it is um, it is April 19 and 20. Obviously, this year uh, we have a fantastic list of speakers. They're all subject matter experts in their field. Teresa and Jeff will be there. Uh, Max Schachter from uh, uh, from Parkland. Uh, you may have seen him on on TV on YouTube uh, uh, talking about his son Alex. He's going to be laying out. Uh, the beginning to the end of Parkland. Carly Posey, who is a mother from Newtown, she's going to be talking about, she's going to be talking about a thing that is really not covered very well in, in school safety conferences. It's called reunification. 
And you may know what that is. That's when an event happens at your school and they tell you to come pick up your kid and the mass, you know, the mass hysteria that happens like, oh, where is he? And then where, and oh, I thought she was supposed to be in the back of the school. She's in the front of the school. So Carly has a, a lot of experience with that because of, of the tragedy at Newtown. So she's fantastic. Um, and, and then Jeff is speaking. I'm going to be speaking on leadership uh, during a crisis. We have a great list of speakers. It's at the Green Valley Resort, which is about 10 miles uh, west of Las Vegas in a city called Henderson. It's a beautiful resort. Um, it's uh, registration is 420 uh, for the two day conference. Uh, it's a it, we kept the prices down, you know, breakfast, lunch included. It's going to be a, a really good gathering of like minded folks and uh, anyone out there that's interested in it. Um, Derek is going to put up the uh, the the link, I think, to the uh, to the conference. We'd love to see you out there. It's not just for school administrators. If you're a parent and you're interested, if you're on a PTA and you're interested, if you're a police officer and you want to know more about what is really going on, we've put the world subject matter experts together in a two-day package that that's unparalleled. I've seen I've seen these things for 15 years. This is the best collection of minds that I've seen. And obviously they'll be there to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. So we'd love to see you there. And let's get the word out there uh, that there is a, a way uh, to, to, to tackle this problem. Derek, you get me those links also. Uh, the the yes. Green, I think it's, it's the Green Valley Resort. Green now. Valley Ranch and Resort, Green Ranch, yeah. yeah. My wife used to work there. She really? Her. Really? Oh yeah, my, that's where my <laughs> wife worked when she was in Vegas. She lived in Henderson. Yeah. I've been there wow. plenty of times. It's, be, yeah. it's actually unbelievable. It's, it's one of the nicest resort. spots in Vegas and it's ironic because it's not on the strip. It's fantastic. Yeah, and you know what it is? I found out is it's locals that go there like for staycations. Like people don't, you know, they don't go down to the Mirage. They go to this place and chill yeah. for the weekend. Oh yeah. We it's used a to beautiful party place. And awesome. I appreciate it guys. And thanks for having me. And it's always a pleasure with you too. And uh, all the best to you and, and your endeavors. Keep doing what you're doing, John. Thanks for everything, buddy. Thank thanks you very much, John. Take care.